So, uh, good evening and uh, welcome <coughs> everyone. My name is uh, Martino Tattara and uh, I'm uh, in charge of the Urban Cultures Engagement, uh, which is uh, uh, the section of the design studios at our school dealing with uh, uh, urban issues. And it is within uh, this framework that uh, uh, the lecture of tonight is organized. I'm here together with uh, uh, my colleague, Rosario Romero, whom will help uh, uh, moderating the discussion after the lecture. For the lecture tonight, I'm uh, extremely happy to introduce you to uh, Leilani Fara. Leilani is uh, the global director of The Shift, an international movement to secure the right to housing and the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to housing, a role that uh, she has maintained between 2014 and 2020. The Shift was uh, launched in uh, 2017 with the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the United, uh, United Cities and Local Government, and works with uh, multi-level stakeholders around the world, including with several city governments in North America and uh, in Europe. Leilani's work is animated by the principle that housing is a social good and not a commodity. She has helped develop global human rights standards on the right to housing, including through her topical report on homelessness, the financialization of housing, informal settlement, right-based housing strategy, and the first United Nations guideline for the implementation of the right to housing. She is the central character in the world win documentary push regarding the financialization of housing directed by the Swedish filmmaker Frederick Gerten. Push is a screening around the world and to continue its momentum, Leilani and Frederick now co-host a podcast called Push Back Talks about finance, housing and human rights. Leilani, Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, we are very much uh, looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Martino. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess, shall I just start now then? Great, sorry, I thought Rosario, you were going to make a comment, so it's good. Um, okay. Um, I want to start by saying, uh, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's quite new for me to be speaking to architects, or I think some of you at least are studying architecture or doing master's degree in architecture. Some of you may be architects. Um, it's a new audience for me in some ways. And my presentation today um, or my comments, it's not really a presentation, but my comments um, are the first time I've tried to um, bridge the worlds, my world with the, um, the world of architecture. And you have to know that I am, I'm a human rights lawyer. And so I only come at it from that um, place, um, but hopefully we can have an, an, um, an enriching discussion. I called my presentation, Rebuilding by Design, The Architect's Challenge. And I hope that as I make my comments, it will be clear what I mean by building, what I mean by building by design, and what I think is the challenge for architects. So I thought I'd start by talking about what's been built. So if we're going to rebuild, then we need to understand what has been built. And when I talk about what's been built, I'm actually not talking about the built environment. I'm not talking about homes or apartment buildings or houses, although I'll get there. What I'm really talking about is societal architecture, the legislation, the policies that have been built, and the societies that have, that have been created as a result of those. And so, so when I'm talking about what's been built, I'm talking about the societies that have been built, in particular, 
what I notice and what I noticed when I was UN special rapporteur is that the, the societies that we've created, particularly in the North and West, is a society where housing that is so fundamental to human well-being, so fundamental to participating in society, so fundamental to health and to life itself, has actually been created as a financial instrument and as a commodity. And that richer sense of housing as home that I just described has been lost. And I think we've built societies where homelessness in affluent countries, in rich countries, which should in fact be counterintuitive, is in fact taken as a given, as the economic order of things. So if you think about it, as societies continue to progress and become wealthier, I just learned, for example, where I'm from, Canada, we are about to to move up a notch in terms of wh where we are in, um, in terms of GD, uh, gross domestic product in the world. So Canada used to be ranked 10th for many, many years. We had the 10th largest economy in the world. We're about in 2021, we will move up to being the ninth largest economy in the world. With economic growth like that, you would expect to see everyone lifted up right? That's a, it's, a, it's a big thing to move up a notch in terms of GDP. Well, Canada continues to have more than 235,000 people living in homelessness. And I only use Canada as an example because I happen to be researching that this morning for something else. But this is true across Western Europe as well. You're seeing steady economic growth or at least stable economic growth and you're you have high rates of homelessness that should be counterintuitive but it's not we now take it as a given i want to be clear that why i call this rebuilding by design is because the this this in this social environment and economic environment that i'm describing has been done by design. I don't want you to think that this is simply the result of governments taking a step back and not doing much and just allowing markets to control the housing sector. Governments have in fact taken very clear decisions and steps to allow housing to be treated as a vehicle for investors to grow their wealth. Governments have taken steps to allow homelessness to flourish in many societies. And I, I want to bring to your attention, I think often when I talk about this, I, I, I talk about, the neo, about neoliberalism. And while it is true that neoliberalism has laid the foundation for this. Every other kind of economic model that has emerged out of neoliberalism has contributed to it as well. So we have neoliberalism in the late 70s, really in the 80s, and then taking real hold in the 90s and onward, where, and for those of you who don't know what I mean by neoliberalism, I mean where governments take a big step back in the area of housing, for example, and they say markets really can do a lot of the work here. We governments don't need to be too engaged in um, housing and social housing. Um, markets can really take care of the population. It's a real opening up of the housing market. It's a real step back by governments it lends itself to fewer um, tenant protections, for example, and creates things like 
tax incentives and tax breaks for big financial investors in the area of housing. But if you look at the gig economy, or if you look at austerity economies, what we see is the very same thing. So while all of this comes out of neoliberalism, I want us to also recognize the negative impacts that these other kind of economic models, whether it be the gig economy or the austerity economy, contribute to this as well. And I'll give some examples. So, so when I talk about housing having become a commodity what do you know what do i mean what are some real examples that you might be able to relate to i think the mo the one that most people can relate to like that is airbnb so airbnb comes out of both the gig economy and believe it or not the austerity economy so and I mean, we all know what Airbnb is. It's the it, it was originally the use of one's home to generate more income. So you would invite someone into your home, a tourist who could then get a flavor for what it's like to, you know, real life in a different city uh, at a cheaper rate than a hotel. That, of course, evolved into a, a model where um investors purchase properties solely for the use of short-term lets or short-term rentals. So uh, buying up entire buildings and turning the entire building into a short-term rental accommodation or an Airbnb building. Um, I saw this in Portugal, for example, in the beautiful town of Porto, um, where the historic center was being rejuvenated um, and you know, one of the most beautiful places on earth, in my opinion, uh, being rejuvenated and entire buildings were being bought, purchased by investment companies and developers and, and converting these into short term rentals uh, for tourists, not for the local population, sometimes for students as well. Um, now, why is Airbnb problematic? from the point of view of housing as home? Well, I just said, you replace long-term populations with short-term populations. You drive up the cost of housing that's surrounding the Airbnb because an Airbnb can solicit easily 200 euros in, in a, a night versus an apartment, which might um, only secure, um, you know, a small amount per night if you did it on a per night, because of course, long term lets are based on monthly rentals. Um, it eats up existing housing stock. The Porto example is a good one, um, where you know, those buildings could were used to house many of those buildings used to house long term residents and those residents were pushed out. Uh, and those buildings could have been rejuvenated some of them did need restoration, but they could have been rejuvenated and restored for local populations rather than um, the uh, tourists. Another example, this comes out of the austerity. Uh, sorry, I should say Airbnb also is part of the gig economy, but is also part of austerity because some cities like Barcelona and uh, Madrid really opened themselves to Airbnb after the global financial crisis as a way to generate money for the city. And I mean, we can chastise those cities for doing that, but, but they were in a situation of real austerity and really require, and, you know, we all know cities don't have very many ways to generate money, to generate resources. And so they used short-term platforms as a vehicle to drive tourism and therefore tourist dollars for the city to then have more money. Golden visas are another form of this financialized version of housing, believe it or not. They, they sound like visas, they sound like something else, but the, the mechanism is through residential property. So for those who don't know what a golden visa is, this is quite popular in some of the Southern European countries in particular. This comes out of the um, austerity model. It was uh, suggested um, by reg the European Regional Bank and um, in and certainly supported by IMF International Monetary Fund policies. Um, golden visas are where um, foreigners are enticed 
to invest in property in a country and with that investment and there's 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 um amounts that you have to invest with that investment you are uh granted uh, a residency perm permit and then eventually in some places citizenship and some of the levels are incredibly low turkey has some of the lowest levels of investment required in order to get this very valuable residency permit and then eventually eu imagine eu citizenship is is um obviously something that many covet obviously i mean this this has this is problematic in many ways and the eu has recognized that it has allowed for the flow of corrupt capital that's obvious because who many who would in, in want um an alternate citizenship are those who may need to flee their own country um due to their own corrupt uh, business practices etc so um it also allows for the illicit flow of money where money where you don't want to pay tax on your money um but it also results in the purchasing of residential housing that could otherwise be used for local populations but that is being used by a non-resident and i should make it clear the residency requirements are nominal in fact what i've heard anecdotally is that the in, the 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 ultra wealthy investor will purchase the property and then won't ever live in that property and has no intention of living in that property and to meet the residency requirements it's like sometimes it's 30 days in one year and they may just stay at a hotel for example or they send a family member to stay in a hotel so there is no um productiveness to this it's just simply an eating up of existing um real estate and then depriving local populations of that real estate um another example of the way in which housing has been financialized uh is through what we call real estate investment trusts you don't really need to to know more about these than it's just a financial tool and a way to purchase properties um and governments have in about 40 different countries including in western europe enable these trusts they're just like um it's a way to um amalgamate money from a whole bunch of different shareholders often pension funds and insurance companies and you bring together all of this capital and then you can purchase buildings and then the rents in those buildings are the return on the investment and the way in which governments have facilitated reits <coughs> excuse me we call them reits um the the way governments have facilitated this is by simply saying you don't have to pay any income tax so there it a, a tax free way of purchasing property that's a simple way of understanding them and then add to that um that governments including city governments have sold off social housing um as so sorry i should have specified um the non taxation of re of of real estate uh, trusts comes out of um the neoliberal ideology that that um that somehow it's beneficial to society for private actors to uh purchase um property and to then act as landlords um and lastly i'll say excuse me also as a matter of um austerity a number of governments um in the post global financial crisis era sold off social housing as a way to generate income so madrid is is one of the um, better known examples of that um but also in berlin it happened um and elsewhere um so you have that as the what i call the built environment um the the built social and economic environment around housing and then add to that the fact that governments are failing to act so they took all those measures to allow airbnbs golden visas real estate trusts they 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 took decisions to sell off social housing and then to add to that they 
refuse to act, refuse to take decisions to assist those who are most in need. So a failure to provide long-term housing for people living in homelessness, um, people who are being driven out of the housing sector uh, and have and no social safety net uh, to fall into, including during COVID times. So it's a pretty bleak built environment. Um, and then I want to um, suggest that alongside <clears throat> this version of the world, there is a failure by governments to, um, there's a failure of imagination and there's a failure of creativity. And the failure is based, in my opinion, on discriminatory understandings about who deserves to live where and who deserves to live in what. And I'll give a home, home I'll, I'll use homelessness as an example. Um, so when I said that governments have taken decisions to not house people who are living in homelessness, you might think to yourself, well, there isn't enough housing, there's no supply, and, and you know, they, they're, they don't know what to do. You know, governments do care about homeless people, which I agree with that. Generally, most governments have some policy in place um, to assist homeless people. There are some exceptions. Hungary might be an exception. Um, but, you know, they say, oh, we, you know, we don't have enough housing supply. Well, if you take the COVID era, we know that, for example, thousands of Airbnb units were standing vacant during the first year of COVID, right? Because there was zero travel, no one was going anywhere. So there were all these empty units in city after city after city all around the world. And very few cities, very few national governments ever thought that those could be used as homes for people living in homelessness. Now, why would that be? There are some, or, or we, we don't even have to take Airbnb. We could take even um, the uh, Marriott hotel chain. We could take the Intercontinental hotel chain. We could take, um, you know, any high-end hotel chain was sitting empty for a year at the first year of the pandemic. Now, why wouldn't governments have moved swiftly to put homeless people in those locations? It's the failure to be able to imagine that people who are the poorest people in society, who sometimes have psychosocial disabilities and who sometimes have substance abuse issues, it's a failure to be able to imagine that they could avail themselves of beautiful environments, right? A homeless person living in the clean lines and the modern um, decor of an Airbnb unit, it's almost impossible for governments to imagine that. And, and that, to me, is where our worlds really sort of come together. The idea that um, beautiful places and spaces are for some people and not for others people with wealth, people with class privilege, people with, with skin color privilege, um, people with migrant status privilege uh, are allowed to live in beautiful spaces and places. And those with less aren't. So in those ways, we start seeing how I think the built environment reflects the, the the built environment, sorry, reflects the built society and the, the values upon which society is built. 
I always think of the High Line in New York. So many of you will know um, Richard, uh, uh, sorry, Robert Hammond um, was one of the designers of the High Line. And um, for those who don't know, the High Line is in New York. Uh, it's very well known. Um, and it was um, basically abandoned railway lines. And there was a question as to what would be done with these abandoned railway lines. They're up there, you know, in the US, they have those sort of railway lines that are above city level, street level. Um, one idea had been to build a really huge parking lot on part of those railway lines, for example, for cars. And the community rallied, and Robert Hammond was at, was at the, the head of this, uh, along with a, another partner. They rallied to turn the High Line into a big, long park, like a walking park. And um, if any of you have been to the High Line, it's pretty amazing. You know, you're sort of up above and you walk along this path and there are these architecturally designed buildings on either side of the railway lines. And it's some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Um, you know, there are condos there that have condos that have their own individual swimming pools. I mean, it's for the rich and famous. Um, and it is a highly visited, highly touristed um, place. I read an interview with Robert Hammond in Azure magazine many years ago, and he was asked um, to what he attributed the success of the High Line. And his answer actually led me to go and meet the friends of the High Line in New York, um, to meet him and the friends of the High Line in New York, because what he, how he answered was, he said, success, question mark. The High Line isn't a success. And the interviewer was like, what do you mean? It's visited by millions of people every year. And he said, we at, that, that is why it's not successful. He said, we asked the wrong question when we set out to redevelop those lands. We asked, you know, what could we do with these lands? What could we do to make them, you know, used and, 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 and um, attractive and beautiful. But what we didn't ask is, what does the neighboring community need? And by neighboring community, he's talking about all of the low income African American families that live on either side of the High Line in public housing. And so for him, the idea that, that this is a success that tourists from around the world were visiting the High Line pre pandemic, he realized that, that that is not a success and that the people living in public housing on either side of the High Line don't use the High Line and don't visit there and therefore it wasn't a success. And so I think we're at a stage now where, where we need to rebuild we need to rebuild our vision of society. And, and with that will come a rebuilding of the built environment, I think. And this is where I'm in, you know, this, these are my new thoughts designed specifically for you as my audience. So I'm really happy to be in discussion about this. Um, I think what we need to do is we do need to rebuild and we need to rebuild by design. And by design, I mean purposefully. We need to decide what values are going to drive society, policy, legislation. And my work is to put forward the idea that human rights are the values that we need now and that we should rebuild using those values. And by the right to housing, I mean housing as home, housing as a place to live in security and with, in, in peace and with dignity. And that governments will need to proactively go after this in light of what they've built to date, which is quite contrary. And of course, architects will have a real role 
to play in all of this. I mean, what would have happened if the architects along the High Line, so all the big arch star architects, as they're sometimes called, all the big star architects built along the High Line. So what would have happened if some of those architects, if all of those architects had said, I don't want to build here for the rich and famous. What if they had said, mm, maybe we should be building for that community and pointing to the, those living in public housing, the African-American community that had been there for years and years and years. What if the architects had made sure that they included in their designs housing for people living in poverty? What if they had negotiated with the city of New York around that? They could have had a tremendous impact on the High Line, who uses it, how it gets used, how it's perceived. I had occasion to be talking to the city government in Taiwan, and they have a new social housing development that they're very proud of, and they should be. I mean, I haven't visited it because I only learned of it during COVID and I can't get there. But as I understand it, they had architects come in and design beautiful buildings that are social housing, public housing. Taiwan doesn't have a lot of social housing, so this was a new project. It has become a tourist destination allowing for the social housing tenants to have businesses on site and benefit from the tourism, directly benefit from the tourism, coming to see these incredibly beautiful buildings that are social housing. That's the kind of rebuilding that I'm talking about and that brings together our worlds, the human rights world with the world of architecture. What I'm fearful of now are lost opportunities. And so I think, you know, I want to, I'm going to end my comment soon. And I, I, I want to end, I guess, raising a kind of alarm bell. I do think we are at a critical moment. There is no doubt the world is experiencing a housing crisis. I've been saying this for a few years now. The pandemic has underscored it, of course, because it revealed how important home is in, in the face of a deadly virus and how adequate, home, adequate housing is so important in the face of a housing crisis. The world is also, we know it's uncontested in the midst of a climate crisis. And of course, those worlds come together, the climate and housing crisis. Those who are the worst housed, the most poorly housed, those who are living in homelessness experience the climate crisis worse. If you're living in precarious housing, on lands that flood, as many people are, then you're going to be more susceptible to climate, the climate crisis and weather-related uh, events, um, climate-related weather events. People living in homelessness obviously are more susceptible to heat waves, to below normal cold temperatures, et cetera. So we're in this critical moment where we have these crises. And then, of course, we have the virus, which is this ongoing crisis. I'll call it a nightmare crisis. And I feel like we just keep missing opportunities. So when the, when the virus struck, I thought for sure every government would move quickly to end homelessness, to avail themselves of those hotel rooms and the Airbnb units and to, to create new leases and at least try to house people. Some governments did make those moves. I should say that. Some governments did use those hotel rooms. Barcelona did try to, and Lisbon tried to avail themselves of Airbnb units. But overall, I think what we're seeing is as soon as the virus recedes a little bit, homeless people and people who are precariously housed, renters are left on their own yet again. The crisis, the virus crisis has not been used to address 
housing precarity and homelessness. And we know um, during the pandemic, 500 people became billionaires during the pandemic. And we know that billionaires got 54% richer during the pandemic. Imagine that. And they did that not by producing anything in most cases. Most of this money, this accrual has come about through non-productive means, including through residential real estate. So the pandemic is, has been a lost opportunity so far. COP26, the World Conference on, on Climate Change, deeply disappointing to many of the Southern nations as they watched the Northern Western rich nations protect the fossil fuel industry and sell out Southern nations to climate change. So the question is, how do we rebuild when our governments keep missing the opportunities? Where I'm seeing optimism and hope is always at the most local level. And I don't, this is where I don't know how to make the connection with architects and architecture. So maybe you all can help me afterward. I'm seeing tenants movements around the world, whether it's in Cape Town, in Barcelona, in Berlin, and even in Canada to some degree, and certainly through the Black, Black Lives Matter movement, tenants are starting to really push back. And not just to complain and say, this isn't good enough, but they are trying to rebuild. They're writing legislation, they're writing policy, and they're putting it in front of governments. And they're pushing it. They're calling for referendums um, to rebuild, to create a new version of society, a new vision for housing. So I have no doubt that the world needs a reset and that we need to do so purposefully by design and with good design and all that that means. How we get there, I'm putting my faith in the people on the ground and the support that I can provide them and that others can provide them because we know that change always comes from the ground up. I'm gonna stop there and hopefully you'll ha have some questions for me and maybe some answers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the lecture. Um, actually, it, you hit a lot of interesting points and uh, for us uh, in the architecture field, we also feel that it's responsible for not acting uh, with our own profession and um, actually as, as one of the, the tutors for, for one of the master programs, I kind of went out of my way to really focus on this problem because as architects, we don't really do that too much. We don't uh, go to an activist mode. We kind of just follow what a program that they give us or um, whatever developer is telling us to do. And so I think that we need more of these uh, activist ar architects to, to challenge and, and to provide in a creative way uh, new solutions that can empower those that need empowerment, not those that um, already have already the power. And so with the design studio, um, it's called Architecture Design Justice, and it's based basically on this approach to capacitate these vulnerable communities, um, focusing mostly in, in Brussels on the homeless community and uh, trans migrant community, which kind of go hand in hand. Um, and so we focused on on the, a critical real case scenario, which is a homeless shelter here at the center of Brussels and uh, the transformation that it needs to go in order to continue to be opened. And, and so through that opportunity, we are also questioning what are, what is the future of homeless shelters? What is the future of 
um, of, of really getting rid of the, the problem, not to just rebuild another homeless shelter, but to question the root problems of where it's coming from. And, and if it is about this inadequate housing and not being able to afford housing, what are some other solutions that we can think um, as architects to utilize what we know and to utilize um, this sort of meso level connection that we have to from from the policy and from the ground level um, how can we use our role to create this change to create this this kind of uh, impulse uh, and, and and change uh, from where we are um, as, as creators of the built environment and I, I feel like with the design studio we've uncovered many thematics um, and many more questions than solutions, but at the same time, um, trying to understand, first of all, from the bottom up, from real narratives, from stories that we've met from the homeless uh, residents that were at the, at the shelter on which we are um, focusing our project on. And I do think that, as you said, that the power does lie in, in, in the people, the activist groups, the local communities, the solidarity networks that kind of are catching, they, be, they become these nets that from all these gaps that the government doesn't uh, respond or take responsibility from. And in Brussels, you have a very large uh, solidarity network around, around uh, the housing and, and uh, front against evictions and um, just squat networks that host people <laughs> that are not able to find even a shelter to, to, to stay in. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, space. We have a lot of space. There's a lot of abandoned buildings here in Brussels. And, um, and so people, civic, civic society has taken this role to counteract the, this injustices that we're seeing here. Um, and so I, we also, as architects, need to join that, I believe, and, and to, to learn from what's happening at the, at the ground level, grassroots level, and to also utilize our, our strengths and our skills to provide solutions according to um, this movement that we're seeing. And, and so I think that with that, um, I wanted to ask also, because we are always... Um, we are always limited, I think, by, by uh, who we're developing for um, due to the fact that we are within this system and in, in the way that the, our firms are, are managed and the people that we work for. Um, how, what are some ways that, as architects, you said that we can provide different solutions on which we can um, negotiate uh, perhaps a better deal for the people that need to be empowered. Um, have, you, have you seen any other uh, ways that this has been done uh, in, in, in a bigger level? Like, for example, the High Line was a bit of a failure in that sense because of um, there wasn't any sort of other option. Um, but I'm trying to understand if, if you've seen at maybe, maybe in a local level or something on which this has been done um, with, the, with the support of, of, the, of the solidarity networks that are around and um, with the support of maybe some um, governmental level. So there's a, a connection to which this has been done. Um, and then I can open it up after that to... Mm -hmm to the students. Thanks for your comments, uh, Rosaro. I, I don't have an example for you of the kind of coming together um, that uh, I think you're looking for. I, I did um, have a discussion, and this is, I mean, People won't like this generally, but, and it was, it, this is a project that died, but in the city of Toronto, um, Alphabet, the company that owns 
Google, um, had a project that they were working on on the waterfronts of Toronto, which is long, dis- not disputed exactly, but sort of it's it's a, a piece of land and an area that is undeveloped and and has is constantly being talked about in terms of development it's going to be developed it's going to be developed and nothing happens with the lands and there i mean there it's it's very good location is toronto is a city that's actually very close the downtown core is very close to the waterfront so it's actually a very good location um and so alphabet um had somehow got engaged in this and it was quite controversial because people didn't want a you know a smart city to be developed or smart community and there were issues around data pri- privacy and et cetera. but if we put that aside what they were proposing was to build um a um it, it was called sidewalk labs and i think that's what it was called sidewalk labs and they were proposing to bring together community architects, the city, and try to com- create a community that wasn't just for the affluent. And they were trying to figure out an economic model that would work um, to enable low income people to live there. Um, they had come up with some very clever design ideas, I thought, that were really based on what low, lower income and racialized communities, um, what would draw them to the area, because you want to make sure that not just that they're living there, but that it becomes a hub for their communities, right. And so, for example, originally, someone had proposed putting in tennis courts. And then I mean, Toronto has a very large Jamaican Canadian population and and, um, and um, African Canadian population, and it became really clear that that population doesn't play tennis; they play basketball. And so they decided, for example, that okay, let's put in basketball courts to ensure that they actually feel like they're part of a community and that the broader community might actually come and visit and play and create this vibrancy. Those sorts of decisions were, they were trying to make those sorts of decisions. So it was a real coming together of architects and designers and community planners, and they were trying to engage the city. The project failed, so that will tell you something. Um, the the economic model that was being proposed uh, was part of the problem uh, in, in that um, it wasn't deemed profitable enough let's put it that way. And that was because of the insistence by um, those who were develop trying to develop the lands or proposing to develop the lands, insisting on a higher percentage of low income people being able to live there. And I think the 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 harbor front or whoever owns the land said that um, they were devaluing the land that way. So I'm going to leave that there. Just imagine that, right? By not by not ensuring that uh, that a greater percentage of wealthy people could live there devalues the actual value of the land. Say no more. <laughs> yeah, it's a we we just need a change of mindset and economic models and just a huge uh, yeah all together. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some questions already from the audience. Um, there's a raising hand here. Maybe, maybe Rosie, if there's a, um, maybe just a small, yeah. uh, I mean, as we do normally uh, for students who want to uh, bring questions to the table, they can uh, raise their hands uh, and then we can allow them to turn on their microphone and camera. I think that would be the best way. Um, yes. Otherwise, question can also be posed uh, in the chat, but I think it would be nice to uh, have the student live. So please, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand in uh, with the tool which so is we, in the lower we have, bar. We have uh, Jesse that's had a question on here. Um, and then uh, there's also Eva that just posted on the chat, but maybe she can also go on afterwards. Okay. Welcome. Hello. 
So I, thank you very much for the talk. It was very uh, um, a nice review and nice to, uh, to hear your perspective. Um, in my own uh, research, part of what I've been looking at is historic housing crises, um, uh, going back to the 19th and 20th century. And uh, I, I found it quite, I mean, interesting how oftentimes the, the solution to the crisis or the way that the crisis unfolds, um, it unfolds in a way, in, uh, or it only somehow gets resolved when uh, affluent parties are also somehow affected and that they actually have some sort of stake to resolve things. Uh, that if there's a cholera outbreak or something, that it actually touches the lives of the better off. Or if there's a shortage of materials and labor, that this also affects uh, the wealthier classes. And whereas what I see today is that it really does become, and I think you expressed it quite well, um, uh, quite segmented in terms of populations uh, and sort of, it's very oppositional today, right? Where uh, in fact, wealthy homeowners benefit from uh, lack of housing, uh, as you mentioned through uh, Airbnb, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you, you have any insights as to how, what kind of movements or, uh, uh, organizations, or how can the crisis be framed in a way that is not dependent on that uh, that opposition, but rather somehow <laughs> makes this a, a a problem that all of society should uh, you know consider. So. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, now you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. That was, um, I really liked your observations and I would love to read your work once it's finished because I don't have such good knowledge on the history, believe it or not. Um, I reading everything so current these days. I've, I, it's funny because the, the other day I was just thinking, God, I really wish I knew the history of dot, dot, dot. And so I will rely on your work eventually, Jesse. Um, so Berlin offers us one of the most interesting examples of the way in which um, the, the movement of Berliners involves, <coughs> excuse me, both people at the lower end of the economic spectrum and up into the middle classes. And the reason is because in Berlin, 85% uh, of uh, households are renters. So they're renters for life, which is something you don't see, for example, as much in Southern Europe, right, where rent rental accommodation is, is sort of a newer phenomenon post <laughs> a lot of it post um, global financial crisis. And so as a result, it's a movement that really brings together the interests of a whole swath of the population. And I think it's at least in part because of that, that their movement is as strong as it is, as loud as it is, is being heard as, as, as well as it is, because many of the politicians themselves would be renters in, Berlin, in the city state of Berlin. So that's different than Germany as a whole, obviously, but in Berlin in particular. Um, so I do think that there are benefits there um, one of the worries is, and not in Berlin, but elsewhere, is, you know, you get a lot of these, uh, like in England, for example, they have movements around generation rent and, and generation in Canada, we have one called generation squeeze. And it's really about the inability for young people to ever own a home. And you know, it kind of muddies the conversation a little bit, because though, of course, I, I, I don't want young people to have to live with their parents all, the, all their lives. We know that from the pandemic, let me tell you, I know how unnatural it is. I've got teenagers who are spending way too much time with me. It's unhealthy um, for sure. But that does it mean that they should, they have a right to own and then it, it just it changes the conversation so we have to be a little bit careful or sometimes you know middle class middle class um demands will take precedent over the lower income demands and and where human rights is concerned, we're really focused on the most vulnerable populations. So we really need to keep our eye on that, those groups. Um, so, so that's the only concern there. Um, but I, where I do think we, 
there might be some room to move is I think a lot of people are getting just distressed by how crappy our societies are. Like people are getting really upset generally that they walk down the street and they see a lot of people living in homelessness and abject poverty and, um, you know, how expensive everything is and the fact that their kids won't ever be able to live in a, in a city, right? I think if we could harness that, but make sure then that the responses are human rights oriented or the responses are based in a set of decent values, because of course you can imagine rich person walking down the street saying, oh, I can't stand seeing all these homeless migrants all the time. That can lend itself to a real right wing, horrible response. So we don't want that. (laughs) But is there a way, is there some wiggle where we can harness the sentiment of, don't you want to live in a society where more people are happy, where more people feel good, where where more people have human well-being? Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what the social contract is about? You know, if we can harness that and then have that inform social policy and and financial policy in a way that's human rights compliant, then I think we might get some movement, but I don't know. Sorry, that was a long winded. I didn't have a good answer to your question, but. Thank you. It was very good. And then we have Eva. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Thank you so much for uh, your lecture. I think it was very clear, uh, very clear message. Thank you. Um, I was uh, wondering, um, like, what's Leilani's view on those initiatives that, for example, uh, make use of vacant spaces, but these vacant spaces are often, I think, in old and yeah, not very qualitative uh, buildings. Um, and so would you say that these initiatives are actually helpful in, in achieving this right to housing for all? Yeah, um, I mean, I think they can be. And I think governments have to avail themselves of any resources that are available. And so it might be, I, I mean, where, where I, you know, I'm not talking about toxic lands, <laughs> that wouldn't be acceptable. But where you have a B grade building, um, can it be made an A grade building? Can it be rejuvenated in some way? I mean, it has to meet adequacy standards under international human rights law. So adequacy, adequacy means, you know, access to basic services and affordability and, um, you know, the place has to be a decent place to live. I do think that that using vacant buildings and older buildings can be useful and, and can work. In actual fact, I just discovered strangely, I, I thought I would have known this before, but in the US, um, that is actually one way in which a lot of affordable housing has been built over the last 20 years. So um, they have, I don't agree with the economic model, because what they do is they, they basically pay, in a way through tax credits, they pay very wealthy developers to build these places and or take vacant lands and build and then they they partner with a charity and the charity kind of runs the building and um it has provided a lot of affordable housing for a lot of tenants across the u.s the problem is that um it's time delimited so i i believe in creating especially right now when i talk about rebuilding and i didn't get into the details in my presentation but I really believe that now is the time for governments to start increasing their own assets. So they should be purchasing these things and retaining them as their own assets. It doesn't mean they have to run them. They can work with nonprofit organizations and community housing associations, et cetera, but they should be purchasing them and then working with architects and others to to turn them into beautiful places and spaces for low income people um, who are most in need. Um, what I don't agree with is giving huge tax concessions and all sorts of, you know, basically paying developers to do this kind of thing. I, I'm not sure that that makes good sense, um, given that they will ultimately end up profiting through the rents 
generated. So, um, but I, I, I think, um, sorry, I'll just say one last thing. I'm not, I'm not being as concise as I'd like to be. Um, I think in the era of, um, you know, climate change, we actually have to figure out how to repurpose buildings because we know that um, 40% of emissions is comes from the built environment uh, from um, including residential housing. And so um, we don't, you know, building, building, building is not good for the environment and in so many different ways. And so um, we need to figure out how we can repurpose. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, I don't believe in it's com it gets complicated. I've been pushed on this by some governments in when I was UN rapporteur around the migrant issue and European governments saying, well, do you like, do we really need to provide like, you know, top notch housing for migrants? And I mean, a lot of migrants, um, might go back to their country of origin. And there's a lot of issues there around what's acceptable. But I mean, I think most people know what is dignified housing. And so that's the demand. Whatever you create has to allow for a dignified life. Yeah, well said. I think we lost uh, Eva. Yeah, we lost Eva. Yeah. Um, but I, I do agree. And, and here in Brussels, we see that uh, actually the the squats are the ones that are permitting um a lot of the migrants and trans migrants and even homeless people to right. to live there and 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 now their governments are not even supporting this uh, informal supports that um, and instead mm. they're evicting them yeah. and, and cleaning out these buildings because someone else is going to build there yeah um and then there's temporary projects that are being open called for um, some sort of uh, temporary projects to be built around some cultural um, development of the area, but not taking into account um, how these, this will also move and displace more communities from that area by mm -hmm. creating um, or raising the rents because of this temporal Right. Occupations for for whatever bar can get um, that gets to be developed there for for a temporary amount of time. Um, and wow. then, yeah, so so I, I think in here in Brussels, the the problems are um, even within this uh, temporary solutions, also projects, um, they are they're not supported in a way like the the meaning the informal ones but then what the government supports are these temporary projects that are formal that are taking advantage of these abandoned buildings but they're not giving it to the people that actually need it the most but they're just benefiting those that uh, the rents will go up and the developers that will build after mm. so you know I, 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 I hear that uh, in many places, so it doesn't surprise me, but it does dishearten me. Um, I was just thinking, you know, there's a way in which architecture really can make things so radical. Um, I can see that governments would be um, nervous um, to include architects in certain ways. So I'll give you an example that I was thinking about. I don't know how you would react to this, but so so in Canada right now, there's a real crisis around um, homeless people putting tents up in parks because there's nowhere to live. So the shelters, when, when the pandemic hit, the shelters decreased in number of beds because of physical distancing rules and requirements, right? And so a, a shelter that let's say had 100 beds became a shelter that had 30 beds. And so where do the 70 people go? And then homeless people started realizing it was it's much safer COVID wise to live in a park because you're living outdoors right? So you, your fresh air, which we all know is good in COVID, and you can physical distance, and then you don't have to abide by all the rules of a shelter, right? Which are often terrible for homeless people, like no pets, no conjugal relationship, no, um, no alcohol, like all the rules that none of us could live by in our own homes. <laughs> like I've got a dog, I have a glass of wine every night, you know, all those rules. So, so it became a real problem. And 
um, of course, we have some of the harshest climate in the world in Canada, it's really cold in the winter and really hot in the summer. And so some industrious folks started to build these little huts for people to live in, in the parks, like just, you know, throw up some wood and put on a roof, nothing fancy, not architecturally designed, not compliant with the human right to housing, of course, but just to give them a little bit of extra protection so that they wouldn't get hypothermia and, you know, have to have um, fingers taken off, etc, because of, of um, frostbite. So the governments, of course, say, oh, these are shacks, and they, they evict, and they take them down, they pull them down, etc. It's really horrible. They bring in hundreds of police and etc. One day, I was looking at a website of national parks in one of the near one of the cities where this was happening. And in these national parks, where people go hiking, you know, for and you can camp overnight, they had these beautiful um, little hats up on stilts almost and they were gorgeous like they they were clearly designed properly by maybe by architects I assume so and I thought to myself well why wouldn't they could become an ins an art installation almost in a park and then people could be living there they're so beautiful and if they, they were multicolored and you know and then I started to think oh are you kidding Leilani like because the built environment, when you bring in beauty and the built environment and it becomes popular, it becomes part of the society. It becomes, and they don't want anything to be permanent, right? So there's a way in which I was just thinking, that's just a small, long-winded example of the of a radicalism that comes with architecture, I think. That, that I think we need to explore more and figure out how to use it proactively to, to make our cities better places to live. I mean, I'm wondering like, why wouldn't in Brussels, why wouldn't they regularize the squats and turn it into long-term housing for people? I understand there's an issue around jumping the queue. So lots of people might be waiting for social housing and just because those people are squatting, should they be entitled to get there first because they're squatting. But to me, it's a separate issue. Deal with the building and then deal with that issue, right? Regularize the building, make sure they have access to services, et cetera, et cetera. I'll stop there. Thank you. I feel the same on that. <laughs> um, I think we should move on to some questions because um, there's Emma. Um, are you able to turn your camera on? Yes. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. So first of all, also thank you from my side. It's uh, super interesting to hear what you have to say to that topic. Um, I'm one of the students from the Design Justice Project, and um, it, my my question is actually quite related to what uh, you were just talking about um, just before, and it's mainly um, that we are since we started the project talking a lot about this. Um, relation between the formal and the informal what we've heard a couple of times now and um, I'm I'm really wondering which um, approach seems more promising to us like is it should we go and try to try to change the governmental approach um, try to make social housing again more of a priority on on the politics policy level or is it maybe something where we agree it's it's a field that we as now I'm talking as we as architects but also, but also just we as citizens don't really have influence in and then maybe we can just come from the other side and empower this activist movement and try yeah see this approach as more promising so I don't know if if it's actually a real question or just yeah, an no. observation. I if I understand it as a question, and I yeah. I think it's super important what you raised actually because it's something I didn't mention about human rights. So I only gave a very um, top level description of what the human right to housing requires, you know, to live in peace, security, and dignity. But um, I think it's not an either or. So the way it should happen is. Whatever governments decide 
to do. They should, that should come from their engagement with populations. So governments shouldn't like, oh, they're sitting in their offices dislocated and disconnected from communities on the ground and make decisions. Those will lead to the worst decisions and they always do. The, the example people give often is met in Mexico City. I don't know if you've seen the picture. It's a very famous picture um, of the housing. So, you know, Mexico City has tons of people living informally, right, in informal settlements. And um, they build their own homes and um, on the sides of mountains and, you know, in various locations because they can't afford anywhere else and there is nowhere else to live. And so the C Mexico City decided at some point, oh, no, we're going to try to solve this. So they built all of these uniform um, very basic and white homes and put them on the outskirts of the city, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes. And some people move there and then immediately move back and they stand vacant now. And the reason is because no one wanted to live way the hell out there. It wasn't close to where anything was for them, their employment, their family, their community, etc. So that's a, just a typical example of trying to solve a problem without actually communicating with, with those who you're tr supposedly trying to assist. And so the way it should happen, and this is a tenant of the right to housing, is participation. And so if a government says, well, we think we need more social housing, well, they need to figure out whether that's true by talking with low income communities and where would they like to live and how would they like to live and what models do they want to live in before designing i mean surely this is part of social justice architecture before designing anything you would talk to the people who are going to live there and it's amazing when when you do that i mean i've seen communities um designed by and and built by people people who are indigenous, for example. And what's meaningful to them is not meaningful to other communities necessarily. So in, in fact, in Mexico City, I went to one building complex that it was a, a squat originally, and eventually they do have a regularization program in Mexico City. In Mexico, um, it takes forever. So it took them 10 years to regularize the land. And then they they took ownership, this indigenous community took ownership over the land and could rebuild the buildings. Well, I mean, it was incredible. They had micro enterprise built into the to the model. So they had um, like small stalls and businesses, you know, at the street level of the building, they had a sweat lodge in the courtyard of the building. So a place where they could go and do their spiritual activities. Um, they had these huge murals on the walls, on the sides of the apartment building that were, you know, um, by indigenous artists. So like a completely different approach than a non-indigenous community might come up with, right? So, so, I mean, I guess that's a long, again, I keep having these long answers, but, um, I think that's, I think that, I hope that makes sense to you, Emma. It does, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, then we have Victor, and then I have a Q&A question uh, from someone that can't turn their camera on. Hello, uh, hello Leilani, thank you so much for your, for your speech. Uh, it was very inspiring. Uh, I just wanted to say that I watched also the documentary about uh, called the push and it's it was very, very inspiring. I regretfully I didn't uh, know your work before the documentary, but I, I was, um, I, I was already following the, the steps of your predecessor actually at the, um, at the UN from Ronique because I'm yeah. from Brazil so she's a ah, cool. quite, yeah, yeah she's great. <laughs> she's amazing. Yeah, she's, she's amazing yes. Uh, but I wanted to actually to ask you two questions, one of which I think you have already hinted a little bit of a, of a, um, a response. Uh, but the first question is actually how, because you've talked about these examples of, of um, one thing that started as, as uh, it was designed for one purpose and then all of a sudden it turned into something else. So um you know in a way that neoliberalism kind of appropriated out of this of this um project in another way so uh, either the airbnb idea the 
uh, High Line as well as it happened. And also the temporary occupations that Rosie commented here in Brussels, it's also the process that is happening. So I, I wanted to ask you like what, what um, actually we can do as designers uh, to avoid this kind of uh, appropriation from these uh, projects. That's my, my first question. And the second one is that um, I see a little bit of a, a trend in the, at least in the research field, in the architecture and also uh, urban planning, uh, in in the around the commons idea from uh, Lino Ostrom, uh, I believe you're also uh, aware of it. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what do you think that um, if if this is a, uh, actually um, that could be an answer against the commodification uh, uh, against commodification actually? Um, yeah, that that's uh, the second question. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Hard, hard questions. Um, I, I don't know about how to avoid appropriation, except that appropriation comes from generally values that I don't agree with and that aren't human rights values. And so, I mean, I think that w there's, I don't know, maybe it's a pipe, maybe it's a dream, the idea of having societies built on a set of values that that wouldn't lend themselves to appropriation um the, the problem is sometimes i mean when airbnb started i don't know if we could have predicted what ha what happened but could we really have predicted i don't i don't know um i do feel capitalism has and you would have heard me say it in the film push but i think i mean there's capitalism and then there's capitalism. And I mean, we're in capitalism now, like uber, uber um, wealth out there, like never before unprecedented amount of wealth with, with, and nowhere for it to go where it should be going is back to governments. And that's not where it's going, right? A lot of this wealth is not being taxed and it is not benefiting government. So they can't even, you know, fix up a, a hole in a road because they don't have enough money. Meanwhile, billionaires increase their money by 55% in a pandemic, right? So, so we're in this kind of crazy place where I'm not sure we can always predict what's going to happen from good things. One thing I have been arguing for, and this is so, this is very granular and micro compared to your question, which was a more macro question, but I keep telling governments like, You've got to build in per, um, perpetuity into, into like, you have to build in this value for life. If like, that's how I feel because those big financial actors will figure out a way around any law, legislation, policy. That's, that's what they do. They get the most brilliant lawyers to navigate legal systems around the world and, and then, somehow undermine what was intended you know so so for example when i said earlier i think governments need to start building their own assets again in perpetuity in other words that's why i want governments to buy the buildings i want them to buy the buildings and to never be able to sell them <laughs> and i want when social rents are set i want them to always be social rents forever forever, forever, not this. So the example I gave in the States where they use, where they're, they use tax incentives to get affordable housing built, there's a 30 year limit on that. After 30 years, the affordable units can be switched over to market. Unacceptable, un inappropriate, you can't do that. So that then leads to your question about the commons. And I think there is a lot of value to be thinking about about different models. The, the question will always be scalability. Does it work across uh, jurisdictional um, lines? Like, does it depend on your, the, the, the legal infrastructure in a country? Um, how do you build the commons, um, et cetera? So, but I do think that we're in an era where people are starting to think about things like that more and going back to those ideas. Um, yeah, whether like, I just don't know if it's structural enough. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if it's like the answer. Maybe there's no answer. Maybe we need a whole bunch of things. Um, well, I'm, I mean, maybe you have an opinion on both of your questions. 
I kind of do, but uh, I'm not sure if I have the space to. <laughs> oh, come on, give us a sentence. Why not? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I think I actually, I, I'm kind of still studying in the research about the commons and how it could actually be applied in, uh, in this, um, maybe the creation of autonomous communities inside the urban uh, fabric. But I think I, I think I, I, I maybe I agree with you as well. Like I think I see a lot of potential in this in this um, idea, and I think it it could. Uh, I, I've I've read some actually papers using this the same um, this this um, this comparison about saying like we can use maybe commonification against commodification. It's uh, uh, so there, there's mm. a, a like a, a direct uh, kind of relationship to it. Mm. Um, and I think actually uh, when I said that you, maybe you hinted the, the, the answer for the first question was uh, because I think it's also a matter of communication, uh, the fact that we can avoid some, 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 cert, some kinds of appropriation from the, from the neoliberalism. Because I think when we propose some things, maybe the community is not ready even to, to, to understand uh, what is being proposed and not, um, yeah, not aware of all the, the the circumstances that they are they are into, like they are just living every day, like it's uh, the next day. So you don't have this overview of okay, now liberalism. Right. Yeah. So I think there's also a problem of communication and, and participation, and how can these people be involved in the process in the process since uh, since the beginning, and how can they envision also what what we can what we can um, put put in as as a designers. Yeah. yeah. I think most communities most countries most cities most go most governments at every level have a very uh, thin understanding of what democracy means and what democratic participation is i mean it's like it's been devolved it's like you vote like if that's all democracy is like i get to vote every four years come on this idea of participation and voice and communities having voice, that's very important. And that's one of the things I love about the human rights framework, because we're really starting as human rights um, activists, we're really starting to build out what meaningful engagement means with communities. And that would be really key for architects, I would imagine as well. Thank you yes. so much for your comments. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I, I do agree on that. Actually, I think this is where we're moving forward in social architecture is to work with the community, more engagement, more. Um, so we are taking a bit more um, going outside of our profession and actually expanding it because it's also a one way to, to enrich it, to really make it more participatory, more engaged with the community in, in the way that we do things in the design process and opening it up and making more transparent. Um, and, and I think that's where the next question comes in um, with, this is someone that couldn't turn their camera on, uh, utterly asks about, as architects, I feel like um, the moment that we can negotiate is when we propose a project and all through our studies, we develop imagination through space. We imagine projects with layers of complexity. As designers, we live in our design in the eyes of the future inhabitants, but also seeing it from above and in its social cultural aspect. The project is shared through images that in order to be understood by the non-architects. In practice is through those images that the design is sold. And honestly, it feels not enough. Are they strong enough to enable imagination of the one who decides whether or not the design will be chosen? Um, so that's that's really the the question that I can I also remark on is it enough to as architects just to sell images um, in that sense? Well, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that, but um, it's interesting because I feel like all I do is use words, and I really feel like I need images. <laughs> I think images are very strong, and I think we live in a visual world these days to some degree. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about the process to know. Obviously, it's not going to be enough. I mean, how do you? I don't, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, I think yeah. it's not enough, but I think we've been talking about participation 
as being required and what does participation look like? And I don't think it just looks like images mm -hmm. that represent participation. It ha there has to be some other avenue, uh, but I don't know your field well enough to know like how would that work, for example. But I mean, in the case of the High Line, right? I mean, they should have had town halls. They should have gone to the to the people living on the side of the High Line, gone right, but they would never have done. I mean, one of the most expensive, most elite private schools is by the High Line. I mean, they were they're servicing like, I mean, it's you know they they didn't go to the public housing tenants and host a community thing and say like, what do you think? should be done. It was mostly white people, the gay community who who revamped the High Line. So they didn't do broad enough outreach. Um, and like, I don't know what happens when the architects get invited in to build on the side of the High Line. Like, what would have happened if one of them had said, you know, like, I feel uncomfortable building here. Like, I want to be part of this because it's super cool, but I'm a little uncomfortable. What would have happened? They just lose the deal. I, I don't know your your industry well enough. Yes, I, I think um, it's it's a matter of of negotiating um, and having these tools to negotiate and having the right connections to do that as well, um, and to have also the people power behind you to rally up, perhaps uh, to connect to these groups that are already. Um, doing this and so as architects provide your skills and yours your ways I, I think images are strong they they are they're conveying a, a sort of um what if we do this instead possibility and and i think that's the the one way that we can really do that and of course we can also be, be more involved within the community become advocates in that way um but yes, this is an ongoing uh, question for us as well. What, what is our role in all of this? Um, yeah. One of the things I found interesting about the High Line is that um, this is separate from the architects, I suppose, but the, the buildings that are along the High Line, those condos, um, they don't give any money to the High Line. They're not required to give any mm. money to the High Line. They don't contribute to, so, you know, that could have been one thing where the, where it was built into the deal, where the buildings have to give back to the community somehow. Yeah, true. You know, a community tax. So we, we, sh we should also go into that direction as well um, to, to understand uh, what are the possibilities in the, in the economic solutions that we can also provide uh, as part of the deal. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have a question from Ava. Are you here? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, go back to a part of the discussion with uh, with Peter when it came up that um, you know uh, cities uh, should start buying uh, more buildings and and land again and not sell them off as they are currently doing. Um, and, and I personally agree with, with that stance, but I also do wonder, like, what choice do cities really, really have? Because as you also mentioned before, it was also out of a financial interest that they allowed Airbnbs in certain cities uh, in, in the beginning. Um, and also today, I think very often selling off public land is informed by, yeah, actually just looking for cash for cities. And, and, and that's, of course, that austerity environment that they are that they are in and so how how can they escape that dynamic uh, i think that's also very hard for an individual city so so what would you answer to that yeah and i think your well your, your analysis and your diagnosis is quite correct um and it's a real worry because the the when I talked about the financialization of housing, I didn't really talk about the actors so much. I mentioned pension funds, insurance companies. They are the ones who give their money to private equity firms. Private equity firms have liquidity, liquid cash. They buy things with cash. And I mean, they have, okay, so the, the, one of the largest private equity firms in the world is uh, Blackstone. And they have 700... A billion dollars of assets under their management. I mean, 
they have billions of dollars of cash available to them. So how can, what you're saying, Eva, is how could a city compete with that, for example, and they can't. And that's why the lands and the apartment buildings, et cetera, are being purchased by, by investors who have no, so no, they're, they are amoral. They have no, they're not driven by any social values and certainly not by human rights or social values that we would consider to be good social values. So um, it is, it is a huge problem. And it's even worse in that no one can even compete with them, even within the sector. So if you take a big developer, so I, I had experience recently where I was talking to kind of, you know, meeting, you'd call in a, in a city of a million people, this developer would be kind of a mid-sized developer. And there was a building for sale. And I was concerned that some big investors would come and buy it. So I said to this medium-sized developer, couldn't you go in and make a bid? Because this, this, his company is a family company and they don't believe in evictions and they believe in affordability and all sorts of things. And he's like, are you kidding? I can't compete against those guys, right? I can't get the loans that, I mean, these big investors get, get free money. They're, they get free money. They get interest-free loans because they're so liquid and they're so powerful. So, and they have political power. So I don't have answers to that. Those, those are big questions that are bigger than me. I mean, we need different monetary policies, even regional banks and central banks need to change how interest rates work. Like it's, it gets very complicated and maybe beyond the scope of, of the webinar today, but uh, it, is, it is a problem. Um, national level governments do, do have a role to play. They could better enable cities um, give them more competencies and more resources um, to do the kind of purchasing uh, that I'm suggesting. I'm seeing a little bit of it here and there, uh, but not enough. If I may jump in on this, Leilani, I, yeah. first of all, thanks for the question, for the presentation. Um, it seems to me that you um, somehow advocate or um, suggest uh, coming back of the public in the form of national government uh, initiating uh, policies that would change the situation, let's say in parallel perhaps uh, to more uh, perhaps small case, small scale interventions. So, uh, uh, but in, in a way, what I think is very strong uh, in your talk is indeed uh, this sort of uh, uh, support uh, uh, for a kind of engagement in the issue of housing at the state level. Um, which in a way I agree would uh, be what in a way would really be able to guarantee value for life. So from your global perspective, it's a very simple question. So uh, where did you see uh, maybe something like that uh, taking place or changing uh, that would, you know, perhaps be inspirational? Uh, I mean, for example, we are based in a country where, you know, it has one of the highest property home rate uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, although we are not from the Mediterranean region, but uh, still, we're still like that. So, and of course, this is the result of, uh, you know, decades uh, of uh, a political project that has actually supported uh, going in that direction. Uh, and where, of course, it becomes very difficult to think, to move into, let's say, <laughs> or to change the perspective on that. Uh, but have you seen, uh, let's say, things changing in that regard and some or examples that in a way we could you know, think, see that, uh, you know, things could change and could, uh, you know, move in different direction. It's very, um, like, a little thing here, a little thing there, uh, you know, there isn't a place I can point to and say, oh, they're doing amazing, but there have been small developments. For example, in Cape Town, South Africa, of all places, there is a group, um, and if FUNA, I think it's called. Um, so they're an urbanist group and a human rights group, and they've been um, monitoring lands in Cape Town. And whenever they see a space or a place in Cape Town that could be used as social housing for the African, Black African population in South Africa, they go after it. They don't, per they're not purchasing it. What I mean is they, they lobby for that parcel of land, that building to be used 
for those social purposes. Um, they have been successful most recently, for example, in lobbying for a, um, what's that called? Golf, like the, the sport golf course that's in the middle of the, of the city of Cape Town that's only used by white people. So it's all these like big lands for a golf course. Meanwhile, the black South African population is living in terrible squalor, as you know. Um, and they've negotiated, I think, quite successfully. And I think I can't remember which level of government it was with, um, whether it was the provincial government or the national government or the city government, but those lands will be used now for social housing. So um, they challenged the purchase of an old school by, no, was it a school? Yeah, I think it was a school by a private or it was, I forget, maybe it was an old hospital and it was going to be converted to a school by a private um, school, um, not the state. And they challenged that in the courts and they managed to win and that property now will be used for social housing. So, I mean, but these are like, ping, one little thing, ping, you know, you look at Barcelona, Mayor Kalau has done a lot of things, um, but they're like, they're not overarching. What I'm really looking for is and hoping for is that governments would adopt national strategies that would create real change on the ground and would include like a whole bunch of measures all under one strategy to, to I mean, to make housing more public to or to make private uh, actors in the area of housing more accountable to human rights obligations and to human rights standards. Um, so we're not there yet, Martino. Um, I, I see some movements. I mean, the Berlin, there was a referendum in Berlin, which I'm sure you know about, um, on the 26th of September, which will lead, hopefully, knock on wood, to the socialization of some private units. So, but again, it's like, ping, one, one thing. <laughs> I should say Portugal has um, gone down a path at the national level of adopting a, a human rights based housing strategy, but it's not fully developed yet. I don't think I haven't heard more recently. Um, I was in touch with them about a year ago when I so I don't know what's happened since, but that's the kind of move that I think we need and and where governments understand housing is not should not just be dealt with over here by the housing ministry, that you have to engage finance, the ministry responsible for finance and taxation, and whoever is responsible for climate change and right there and health like these are, it's an intra governmental affair. Okay. Um... There is a question on the Q&A, which I will uh, read. Um, so thank you for your comment and the following question. We were discussing this, the role of the architect in affecting territorial development decisions in Nordic Baltic uh, ASA with Antai Mojava, a Finnish artist and researcher who works in a, a BIOS research unit on foreseeing sociological changes in the architectural field and beyond. The conclusion of the conversation was that the private capital project development mechanism uh, roughly the client brings uh, a task to architect if the architect are not willing to do it another studio will be uh, found to do it could not stay as it is the situation with the skyscraper in new york the pr kingles group made a few proposals were turned down but with architect disagreeing with client requirement the pr kingle group brought in an acceptable proposal uh, following this uh, what uh, could be our negotiation tool in this service market kind of situation in the field of architecture. Uh, Moyava's answer was commercial independence as of an artist. What would, what would be your uh, suggestion? Sorry, I'm just still reading it. I, yes. I had a, a telephone call came through my computer and so I got distracted. Following this, what could be our negotiation? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, um, I'd have to think about that more. And I, I, it's, it's a little bit beyond. I'm, I apologize. It's a, it's, um, um, Augustus. It's a, it's beyond my, um, 
knowledge base. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, that's the, that is the way capitalism works. If one, if one person uh, can't do the job according to what I'm wa wanting to pay for, I'll go somewhere else. I mean, that's so um, could architects um, come together and maybe you already have, I, I have no idea what structures you have in place as architects um, to sort of come up with a social contract yourselves or some kind of a, I don't know, a, 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 I don't know, you know, like where the, the next firm wouldn't touch it because, because of what happened with the previous firm. You know, I don't know how, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more because I don't have an answer. My, my apologies. Well, I think that in such case, there will not be let's say, any chance for an architect that does not comply with the requirement of the developer. But I don't think that architects have a chance, uh, let's say, outside the traditional structure where they get commission from developer. If, uh, and that's maybe what I think architects should start doing today, they start to engage with not only, we'll say, the making of uh, spaces uh, with the making and designing of unit, but to embed these uh, also in understanding, for example, property structures upon which housing is based, and for example, re-engaging also with construction, not just as something that uh, you know is a service provided in order to realize something, but as but something that is inherent. Uh, part mm -hmm. of actually the making, for example, of affordable housing. So I think that in a way, re-engaging with the issue that has been uh, somehow detached from the idea of homes from the point of view of architecture would be very important. Um, but that's maybe <laughs> that's mm -hmm. my little uh, uh, belief in that. OK, um, uh, Rosaura, I, don't, I think there are no more uh, uh, questions. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank uh, Leilani very much for uh, her presentation and for engaging with us in a debate tonight. Uh, I think it has been uh, say great to have you with us. Uh, I would like to thank all uh, the students that have uh, posed questions and that participated in the debate. Uh, and I would like to uh, wish uh, to everybody, everybody a, pleasant, uh, a pleasant evening. Thanks again, uh, Elani, for yes, thank uh, you, your Lelani. inspiring uh, oh. lecture. No, it was a pleasure. Thank you all. And thanks for all the great questions. They were tough. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat>